Rajanya Chakram Prabhuya Madhavaha Tatoya Yo Rama Pura Gamas Shanai Shringala Madhyad Iva Bhaga Riddarihi Ratam sama ropya suparna lakshanam Rajanya chakram paribhuya marabaha Tatoyo yo rama puro gama sanshanai Shringala Madhyari Vabhaga Riddarahi Ratam Samapropya Suparna Lakshanam Rajanya Chakram Paribhuya Madhavaha Tato ya yo rama puru gama shanyai Shingala madhyari va bhaga riddarahi Ladies, Ratam on his chariot, Samaropya, lifting her, Suparna, Garuda, Lakshanam, whose mark, Rajanya, of kings, Chakram, the circle, Paribuya, defeating, Madhavaha. Krishna, Tata, from there, Yayo, went, Rama, by Rama, Puragama, proceeded, Shanai, slowly, Shringala, of jackals, Madhyat, from the midst, Iva, as, Bhaga, his portion, writ, removing, harihi, a lion. Translation. 
lifting the princess on his chariot, whose flag bore the emblem of Garuda, Lord Malava drove back the circle of kings. With Balaram in the lead, he slowly exited, like a lion removing his prey from the midst of jackals. <laughs> so, text 57, which is the last uh, verse in the chapter. Translation, the kings, inimical to the Lord, headed by Jarasandha, could not tolerate this humiliating defeat. They exclaimed, oh, damn us. Though we are mighty archers, mere cowherds have stolen our honor, just as puny animals might steal the lion, the honor of a lion. <laughs> I think Krishna frustrated them. <laughs> purport, small purport. From the last two verses of this chapter, it is clear that the perverted intelligence of the demons makes them perceive things in a way exactly opposite to reality. It is clearly stated that Krishna stole Rukmini like a lion taking his prey from the midst of jackals. The demons, however, saw themselves as lions and Lord Krishna as an inferior creature. Without Krishna consciousness, life becomes most dangerous. Om Agyan Timirandasya Ganajana Sakaya Chaksun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guravena Maha Shri Chaitanya Manobistam Staptitam Yena Vutale Swayam Rupa Kadamai Yam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Bande Ham Shiguro Shi Uta Padekamalam Shi Gurun Vaishnavams Cha Si Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raganatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitam Sya E Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneswari Vrishabhanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Satarine Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Sri Makti Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Iti Namine Sri Varsha Banabi Devi Daite Kagapdaye Krishna Sambandha Vigyanam Daite Bhavave Namaha Madur Otwala Premadya Ribupanuga Bhakti Da Sigaru Kuruna Shakti Vigrahaya Namostute Namaste Gauravani Sri Murtaye Dinatarine Rupanuga Apasadanta Dvanta Harine Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasari Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Vanchakopa Tarubis Chakriba Sindhu Pyebacha Patitanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha hmm. So <clears throat> when the demons perceive the Supreme Personality of God, or even ordinary people, <clears throat> they perceive him as ordinary, or maybe a little bit better than that. <laughs> Therefore, their perception of reality, and anyone who is influenced by the material energy, their perception of reality is not reality. It's something different. Because material energy clouds one's pure consciousness or true consciousness with <coughs> desires to enjoy. And these are like what they call the, and Srimad Bhagavatam calls them uh, colored. 
They're like colored. When you look through a set of glasses that are not clear or they're colored by a certain particular color, you see the environment in that way. And therefore you perceive that as to be, as the actual vision. But someone else is looking through another set of lenses and seeing the same environment or the same situation differently. So therefore in material life, consciousness, no one has any real understanding of reality. It's all perception based on personal desires and interests. So everybody's wrong. <laughs> material life. And the lower or the more contaminated one is by material consciousness, the more wrong you are. <laughs> so you can become wrong and then really wrong. <laughs> so when here we're talking about demons, so we understand a demon is a person who is weighted down by material desires, so much so that that weight becomes you know, his only focus in life is to fulfill the needs of carrying that weight by fulfilling that weight in so many different ways. So, therefore, Krishna came, and Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but he appears as an ordinary personality to persons who can't see properly or have or are covered by material energy. And Krishna appeared as a cowherd boy. He is a coward boy, that's his transcendental position. But they were powerful soldiers and they had armies. Of course, Balaram was leading an army too, but they were, in one sense, seen as inferior in strength and in, you know, fighting ability. But they easily defeated the demons and this here stole the, the treasure, which was Rukmini. Okay. So the verse, or the purport, really says that uh, reality means to understand Krishna. <laughs> Human form of life doesn't really have any value unless one becomes Krishna conscious. Sometimes we say that, and then the human form of life is rare, it's very special. But it's no better than any other form of life if one doesn't take up Krishna consciousness. Because any form of life really that is outside of one's innate spiritual existence or devotional life means to maintain this body in order to find some satisfaction or some position within this world. And so therefore, it's no better than animal life. <laughs> so when Prabhupada would speak very strongly, and he spoke very strongly quite often about what is reality and what is not reality. Many people didn't like to hear that. <laughs> they spoke, he spoke very, very strongly. And people would sometimes would be astonished or sometimes insulted or sometimes taken aback by the, why is he condemning everything? And Prabhupada would say, I'm just speaking what Krishna says. He says, avajanti mamurha, and yes, you're all fools, <laughs> unless you take up devotional life. <laughs> so Prabhupada was humble and not taking credit either for his success or for whatever he did, but always giving credit to Krishna and giving reference to the acharyas and giving reference to Krishna in the basis of whatever he said. And therefore, although he spoke strongly, he spoke correctly. To patronize or to, you know, somehow to uh, try to preach in such a way as to uh, minimize the truth in order to get people to follow just like there was one, what was it? One yogi came to Srila Prabhupada and he was a pretty powerful yogi. He had the power to heal. He had that city where he could heal people's physical diseases. And he liked Prabhupada. And he said, Prabhupada, we can become a team, me and you. We will travel all the way and I'll heal their bodies and you teach them spiritual life. 
Prabhupada said, no, I'm not interested. Because the idea was to attract people with the idea of getting some kind of physical benefit through healing. And that, that would make them receptive. That would make them receptive to spiritual, uh, spiritual knowledge. But Prabhupada didn't want to somehow or other present something in such a way as to trick people. He said, this is the truth. He spoke, tr he spoke strongly, he spoke without pretense, and he spoke without patronizing anyone. Where did he get that mood from? It's coming from his spiritual master, Srila <laughs> Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj. So when we hear Srila Prabhupada in his lectures and his talks and his ways of dealing with people, although he was very gentlemanly, as a great Vaishnava always is, with ultimate regard for everyone, he wasn't about to minimize truth in the, in the name of making friends or in the name of somehow or other making people feel good. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was like that also. He was known as Lion Guru. <laughs> Lion Guru. The Shringa Guru. That there was even a plot at one time, Srila Prabhupada speaks about this, about his spiritual master. Uh, he would speak so strongly against the Smarta Brahmins, against the Kasko Swamis, against others, the impersonalists, the Amayavadis. And that was disturbing a lot of what we say persons, not only those who were being attacked, but others. So they, this became a source of great contention. So they decided to do something quite horrible. They wanted to kill Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. <laughs> you can imagine how strong his preaching was. That if somebody who actually wants to take your life, that means your preaching is really effective. <laughs> Prabhupada, Prabhupada would say that the more successful you are in spiritual life, the more enemies you'll make from the envious and materialists. It's just the way it is. You challenge them in such a way that they feel threatened. And, and according to the potency of your challenge, it upsets their whole way of doing things and embarrasses them and makes them also very, very defensive and very, very aggressive. <clears throat> so they wanted to do that to Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. So they came to one police officer. And in those days, and I guess maybe even today, I don't know, <laughs> police officers are not always up to the standard. <laughs> so sometimes they take bribes. <laughs> so they offered 25,000 rupees. Now this was back in 1918, 1919. How much money that was, 25,000 rupees in those days? It was practically, I don't know, it's really hard to estimate, but I would say it was probably equal to $25,000. A large amount of money. <clears throat> and just so they could get protected or not get, what we say, arrested by the police. But this police officer, he had some sukriti, he had some regard. He said, generally we take such bribes, <laughs> but not for this saintly person. <laughs> and then he came and he warned Bhakti Siddhanta, these men are after you, so be careful. <laughs> so, you see, that when someone speaks strongly about the truth, of course, satyam priyam, satyam bruyam, right? We have to speak the truth, but in a way that is, it doesn't offend people or doesn't insult people, but in the same way, in such a way it doesn't minimize the truth. <laughs> the truth is that Krishna is the source of everything. <laughs> and everything in existence, Ishwara Parma, Krishna, Satchit, Ananda, Vigraha, Anadir, Adir, Govinda, Sarva, Karna, Karnam. This verse spoken by Lord Brahma is the pinnacle of the understanding of the absolute truth. What is he saying? There's nothing outside of Krishna and everything is coming from Krishna and everything that is in existence 
is all is either for Krishna or coming for coming from Krishna, including our own existence, both material and spiritual. Everything. And Prabhupada even said that one time in one lecture. He said, "You're Krishna. I'm Krishna. Everything is Krishna. It's all Krishna." <laughs> he took the oneness aspect. He didn't speak about the uh, the achintya beta beta simultaneous. He wanted to emphasize the oneness, so he made this point. And then later he clarified it in relationship to the energy, that it's also different at the same time one, achintya beta beta tattva. But the one and the difference are both complementary and both the reality within themselves. So even the oneness is, in that sense, true, that there's nothing outside of Krishna. But people don't want to hear that. <laughs> that forces them to take, to look at their own life and see what they have to do in order to come to reality. And so a great soul will speak very, very, very truthfully in order to, it is like the doctor who wants to give medicine to the patient. Knowing that the medicine is very bitter and sometimes even painful, most times when you do get a treatment, the medicine is always not so pleasant. Of course, nowadays they try to make pleasant medicine. <laughs> and sometimes they're very successful. But medicine generally means something that has to uproot something that is foreign within your body. And in order to do that, there is a, what we say, a friction between the disease and the medicine. So that strongness is what uproots the disease or brings about the change. So people don't want the medicine, but they want the cure, right? They want, they want to live in such a way as they can have the best of both worlds. But great souls, they speak what is reality, what is truth. <clears throat> Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was even Although such a great personality was even a cause of anxiety for his followers. Prabhupada would say he, he would be axe preaching or chopping. He would chop and he's, Prabhupada said even my god brothers, they would become a little concerned. Oh, Guru Maharaj is speaking so strongly. He is speaking so strongly. And this will, this will scare people away. Even the disciples. Prabhupada talks about that, about his spiritual master. But he came with a mission. He came not to minimize or patronize, but to give the ultimate. And Prabhupada was like that too, Arshila Prabhupada. Imagine, if, in, especially in Kali Yuga, where everyone wants to feel good at the same time be spiritual. Right? <laughs> That's pretty much the, the mood today, right? You got to give something that makes them feel good at the same time, yet it's also spiritual. So we do that, but we don't do it without minimizing the ultimate principle, that ultimately everything rests upon devotion to Krishna. And therefore, unless one comes to that stage, whatever other activities you're performing really fall short of perfection, of full short of giving you what you're actually looking for, and that is your happiness and knowledge. So great souls don't minimize, but they speak in such a way as to... Giriraj Maharaj tells a nice little story. How he was he tells this story on Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj's Disappearance Day lecture, 2007, I think it was. It was in San Diego, California. And he tells how he was preaching in India in a place, I can't remember exactly where, but he had heard so much of Srila Prabhupada's preaching. And he was inspired to preach like Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> So he was speaking very cuttingly, very strongly, various programs he was going. And he was getting some, you know, what we say backlash, 
Oh, why are you speaking so strongly? Or why are you, why are you condemning so many things? And, but he kept going because he felt that this was Prabhupada's mood. And finally, he, uh, one of his god brothers said, you know, you know, Maharaj, I think maybe he was Giriraj Brahmachari at the time. You know, you can't speak like that. You have to, you can't condemn so many different kinds of groups. Just speak the positive. Don't speak the negative. Right? That's what people want to hear. Just the positive, not the negative, right? So, he thought, all right, but he kept going. Finally, again and again, other God brothers were saying the same thing. So he decided maybe I should tone it down a little, make it a little bit more positive and not speak about what's not. So finally, <laughs> he was also engaged in making people life members. So he came to this one person who was very much interested in our movement. And the man was extremely wealthy, extremely wealthy. He owned many factories. He had a very palatial house, extremely wealthy. And so he's trying to make him a life member. And he's speaking to Krishna consciousness. He decided to make it very positive. And so the man said to him, what do you think of Sankaracharya? <laughs> so there he was on the spot. <laughs> what do you think of Sankaracharya? And he's, well, he was thinking, I, I better not, if, you know, if I condemn Sankaracharya, then I'll, or if I say something that he doesn't like about Sankaracharya, then I'll lose the whole, you know, life membership. So he went, he just started to say, well, Sankaracharya was actually Lord Shiva. He came to, you know, push Buddhism and get away from the you know, Nirishesha Sunyavad and bring back monism, bring people back on the Vedas. The man wasn't happy at all. He kept asking him, what do you think about, what, what do you think about his philosophy, his teachings like that? And fin uh, finally, Gary Raj just starts speaking the truth. Then the man was quiet. He said, actually, I want, to come and I want you to come and, come and see my deities. Come to my place, my deities. I have my deities up in my, this place here. We have a temple. Giriraj was thinking, oh no. Now I gotta go and see his deities. They're probably all, you know, different Mayavads or demigods or whatever. So he decided, well, I, I'll go. And he went and he came into this beautiful little temple room that was very, very nice in marble, very nicely decorated. And on the main altar were deities of Radha and Krishna. Beautiful full-size deities of Radha and Krishna. Giriraj Maharaj bowed down to the deities, offered nice. And then the man said, I was just testing you just to see what is your devotion to Radha and Krishna. <laughs> I was just testing you. So you never know. You never know. So he didn't minimize, but at the same time he was concerned. So we see that's a nice example. How we take shelter of the spiritual master, pure devotee, and pray for their guidance. And then, in that way we can understand just how to proceed. But generally we don't, we don't minimize. Just recently I was in Coimbatore and I was at the Ayurvedic hospital there and I was speaking with some of the doctors who were taking care of us and we were talking and then it's a very pious place and there's a lot of uh, worship of Danvantari and various demigods and Ganesh and Shiva and Hanuman it's a beautiful temple right in the midst of the clinic so it's very, the, the, the atmosphere is quite, you know, spiritually, at least in that sense. So we got talking to one doctor, and he was trained in Benares, <laughs> so you could imagine. So he was really fixed in Imonism. <laughs> and 
I just decided I'm just going to, I don't care he's my doctor, he could just give me the wrong medicine if he doesn't like me <laughs> or do something else. <laughs> Maybe even spike the medicine with something <laughs> bad. <laughs> but I, we just started to talk and I just ba basically said, you know, Ishwara Parma Krishna Sachit and Anda Vigra that we can never become one with Krishna just like a green bird enters into the green tree but never becomes the green tree. It be, still maintains his, his existence as a green bird within the tree. Now he listened and he listened and he tried his arguments there and there and then Bhakti Vigyan Maharaj was also there. So he just happened to show up <laughs> during our discussion where the, this other doctor was getting a little nervous. Unfortunately, I made him nervous by quoting too many verses about Krishna, the Supreme Person. And then Bhakti Vigyan Maharaj started to speak to him also and showed very nicely through Bhagavad Gita how the living entity in any situation of existence remains individual in its, in its material existence, in its liberated stage, and even in its, its stage of perfection as pure pure love. Of course, he listened, but didn't like it. <laughs> he didn't change. That was the last time we had a conversation. <laughs> After that, it was all medicine. <laughs> no more philosophy. So, you know, but somehow or mother, it made an impression, not only on him, he was very thoughtful, but not agreeable, thoughtful. But at the same time, other doctors also heard about the discussion and got a little bit of, you know. So somehow or other, it's very difficult somehow to, you know, change people, but at the same time, we have to not minimize the truth in the name of, you know, patri of trying to make people favorable like that. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, there was one story where one of his leading sannyasis was wanting to raise money for the ashram. And he would send out his sannyasis for preaching and they would collect whatever alms they could. So he was preaching in this one village or one area with a series of villages there. And uh, this sannyasi thought and regularly the tax collector would come along with, uh, would come to the village and people would give their taxes. So he decided to bring the tax collector along with the preaching in order to inspire people to give more. <laughs> and it is a little bit of an unthreatening way. <laughs> so the tax collector and him came and then this sannyasi spoke and this tax collector was very favorable. So people were a little bit intimidated by the presence of the tax collector, figure that he could, you know, cause them a little difficulty if they didn't give. And so they gave more. Now, he collected a lot of money on that day, and then he brought it back to Bhakti Siddhanta. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati wasn't at all pleased at all. He didn't like this kind of cheating method of preaching, or using coercion in order to inspire people to give. So he told them to go back and give that money back to the people, which he did. So although he was so strong, he was righteous in bringing the truth in a way that is acceptable and not in a way that is, what we say, trying to coerce people by intimidation and using various means like that. So. So today we're honoring his disappearance day. He disappeared on January 1st, 1937, it was, at 5.30 a.m. in the morning. On December 31st, 1936, the day before, he was preparing himself for his inevitable departure. And he knew that soon, very soon, he would depart and so he had some of his leading disciples, Sridhar Maharaj, uh, recite the uh, Shikshastakam prayers 
and also sing. Um, it was all he sang Sri Rupa Manjari Pada and Yasomati Nandana, like that. It says that these were some of his favorite bhajans, these two particularly, and preparing himself for the departure. So when a great soul leaves, we see that, of course, when they're there, they establish so many powerful religious tenets that become fundamental in the lives of serious persons. And they change the world in such a powerful way. Even though they don't travel so much, even though they stay in one place, by the power of their devotion, the whole world becomes purified. The great soul doesn't have to go anywhere. Simply by their power and their potency, their pure devotion, Krishna transmits that power everywhere and everyone benefits just by their existence. It purifies the whole atmosphere. So, but when they leave, then we know what happens is that, and it's, it's, it's a feature of existence. It's human existence. There's always those who will take their teachings and somehow change it in something less or something different. This is when Krishna left the planet, when great souls leave the planet, uh, their teachings are somehow changed or challenged and things go down like that. It's just the way it is. We see even in our Srila Prabhupada when he left, even, even while he was here, he was dealing with so many, what we say, principles that were somewhat sahaja and mayavad. Prabhupada had to deal with that so many great souls. But when they're here, they can smash it. But when they leave, we have their words, we have their example. And it's up to the devotees to maintain the principles. So in order to do that, we have to stay strong in our own spiritual practice. Therefore, we should very, very carefully keep good sadhana. Chanting every day our 16 rounds. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati said we should chant 64 rounds, right? He says, I will not accept food from anyone who does not chant one lakh of names, right? So what should we do? We're stuck, huh? We're below standard. <laughs> yeah. Very well. <laughs> but it says, the achar, when that was presented to Srila Prabhupada, one, one, one of Prabhupada's sannyasis on a morning walk said, Prabhupada, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati chanted 64, but you have given us 16. Well, what is the standard? Isn't there a statement in the Shastras that say how many names we should chant? Prabhupada says, he quoted the verse from the uh, Asad Goswami Astaka. What is that? Sanka Purvam Nakana Nadi B. That the one has to fix up a certain amount of number, rounds, and that becomes the standard. Only Acharya can do that. So this devotee said, Prabhupada, you asked the devotees to chant 64 rounds when you first started, but they couldn't do it. And Prabhupada said, yes. <laughs> but then you tried 32, and they, um, but Prabhupada said, I fixed up 16, that was doable. <laughs> so it's up to the Acharya to set the standard. But ultimately, Prabhupada said, that's the minimum. <laughs> 64, it's like when on initiations we say, do you agree to chant at least 64 rounds? <laughs> Minimum, not maximum. <laughs> so, but what is it? It's actually kirtana sadarahi, kirtanaya sadarahi, that one has to constantly chant the holy names of the Lord. As we read the, the lessons from Srila Bhakti Siddhartha Saraswati's writings and his teachings, 
he's always glorifying and making this the point of bhajan to glorify the Lord by chanting his holy names or to glorify the Lord by hearing the glories of the Lord's name, fame, form and pastimes. He makes that the panacea for all ills of existence. This is the only panacea. Hear and chant the glories of the Lord. This purifies the heart, gives one a, a realization of higher consciousness and detaches one from everything less, everything material. It's the, it's, as Prabhupada said, it's the panacea. Along with service to Vaishnavas, the glorifications of the Lord are actually the, the means for perfection in spiritual life. And so, therefore, uh, the great Acharya is emphasize the essence, to hear and chant the glories of the Lord. And therefore, 16 rounds becomes a springboard in order to increase. As, as Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, when you chant regularly every day, you'll chant ultimately always. And that is ultimately the goal of spiritual life, is Kirtaniya Sadarahi is to always remember Krishna. Nena Kena Prakarena Mana Krishna Pnivesaya. Somehow or other remember Krishna. But the means in this age, in the most easy and doable way to remember Krishna, is chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> chant the holy names of the Lord. And so the, the great souls, they come to teach this simple process. But they build a, a whole philosophical teachings based on the Vedas around that, which becomes the focus of everything we do. Because and if we follow the principles of the scriptures as given by the Acharyas, then it becomes easy or natural to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Because when one has to accept what is favorable, in devotional service which will enhance the quality of our existence and therefore we can chant Hare Krishna. If we're accepting things that are unfavorable for our spiritual life, it becomes difficult to remember Krishna, it becomes difficult to practice in our sadhana properly. So that is the cultivation of the existence, but the, but the, the the plant itself, or the seed that is planted by the spiritual master, is to hear and chant the glories of the Lord. So that's why the great souls, they come simply to inspire us in this practice of pure devotional service. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's life is a classic example of pure devotional service from the time of his appearance in the world to the time of his departure. And as we study his life and we see his accomplishments, we see we can take it all the way back to his practically to his early appearance. When he was first appeared in Jagannath Puri. <laughs> I mean to, to be born in Jagannath Puri. <laughs> what does it say? It says in the Skanda Purana, anyone who takes birth in Jagannath Puri has four arms. <laughs> They're actually a transcendental personality. It's such a high birth to take birth of Jagannath Puri. So he appeared in, in one of the holiest, probably the most holiest dham in existence. Of Krishna in the mood of Vipralamba Bhav and Jagannath Puri. And uh, his father, Srila Bhakti Thakur, who was a magistrate at the time, to have the position of a magistrate is very, very, something was very difficult to get, but he had that position. And um, he used his position to institute so many different programs and policies within the Jagannath temple to improve the worship, to improve the regulation, the regulation. But one day, when he was gone, 
his mother, his wife, Bhagavati Devi, she took the little child just to see Lord Jagannath during the procession. And it just so happened that the cart that was carrying the deities stopped right in front of his house on Grand Road. And she took the opportunity to take this baby child and brought it to the lotus feet of Lord Jagannath in order to get the blessings of the, the deity. The child was six months old. And the child reached out for the lotus feet of Jagannath with his little tiny hand. And at that time, Jagannath responded by releasing his garland, beautiful, gigantic garland. And the, the garland fell right around the boy. And then later, she, you know, trans she, she transmitted or talked to her husband about what had actually happened. And he was, he could understand because Bhaktivinoda Thakur was praying, sincerely praying. He was struggling in order to establish Lord Chaitanya's movement. There was so much opposition from different types of asapradayas, from the Sahajyas, from the Sarsmarta Brahmins, from the Mayavadis, and from the materialists. It was difficult. So he was praying with all his heart, please, my dear Lord, send someone from your personal entourage in order to deliver these people, to teach pure devotional service. And little, when this incident happened, he could understand that this was the answer to his prayer. It became his own son. And the life of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati is so amazingly revolutionary how he changed the course of the world's spiritual movements at that time by his preaching, by his teachings, by his example. Although he was so strict in his personal life and so austere and so highly learned and qualified, he introduced principles that seemed to be somewhat material. It's interesting. He understood Srila Rupa Goswami's statement that to use anything in the service of the Lord makes that item spiritual. So in order to facilitate his preaching, he did things that were considered to be wrong. <laughs> he appeared in Radha Kun in a car. <laughs> it says that there was only two cars in Bengal at that time, or in Calcutta at that time. One was by the governor, and the other one was Bhakti Siddhanta. <laughs> when Prabhupada was, our Prabhupada, when he appeared in one temple, I can't remember, I think it was in Los Angeles, they met him at the airport, and they hired this beautiful limousine for Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada was so pleased. And then one reporter, he was a little bit concerned, and you know, this is a, Sadhu, a saintly man, and your just beautiful, expensive, royal car is coming to greet him. And he sees, he spoke to Prabhupada. What, you know, why, why did, why is this big, big reception? Prabhupada said, actually, the car is not good enough. It should be golden. <laughs> <laughs> so what he was saying is that for the representative of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, there's nothing too good that can be offered. <laughs> of course, they never ask for it for themselves, but we understand that because the Lord is the source of everything, everything is, belongs to Him. And so whatever you take and use in His service, or especially for to glorify His pure devotee, there's a beautiful story in the, in the Christian scriptures how Jesus Christ was at one little gathering and the Mary Magdalene, she was a prostitute, but she had a great regard for Christ. Somehow or other, she had gotten hold of this very expensive oil, very fragrant, very expensive oil. And she was massaging this oil on his feet and offering it as an offering of her devotion to Lord Christ. And some people there were a little bit disturbed. Why is he using such expensive oil and placing on his feet? And Christ responded after hearing the criticism. He said, and they, oh, they also said, 
Why doesn't she take the money that she could have used on that oil and give it to the poor, feed the poor? There's so many poor people. We hear that all the time, right? Feed the poor. Why waste money on, not waste money, why use money for, you know, these other things? And Christ said something quite interesting. He said, quite revolutionary. He said, the poor will always be with you, but I will not be. Mm -hmm. In other words, the pure representative of God, his appearance in the world is, is very merciful and very rare. And to get an opportunity to offer something and to serve that is a great, great, great benediction upon all the lives of the people in, involved. And so, in order to convey that principle, he spoke like that. So, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati would not minimize material things in the name of what we say, uh, what we say, simplicity. He used what Prabhupada said, you know, I'm traveling by airplane. If I had to travel by bullock car, I wouldn't get much done, you know, <laughs> or even by walking. So. So we, to use material things in Krishna's service, one devotee was talking to Prabhupada and saying, oh Prabhupada, and Prabhupada was making this point, how we can use everything in, in Krishna's service, you know, all these technological. So pr the devotee said, Prabhupada, then, then we, should, we should create more, we should get more things like that. Prabhupada said, no, let the materialist create it, and then we use it, that's all. We can use it in, their, in the service of the Lord. He says, the, you know, the, the mouse, he digs a little hole and he tries to live in it. And the snake comes in and eats the mouse and lives in the hole. Right? <laughs> or the other story where, you know, the mouse and the, and, the, uh, and the snake are caught in a basket. So the snake is thinking, if I eat the mouse, or the rat, actually, and then we'll, you know, I won't be able to get out. So he encourages the rat to make a hole. And he's, he makes friends with the rat to make a hole. And then the rat makes the hole. They both get out, and then the snake eats the rat anyway. <laughs> the Prabhupada said, this is, this is our movement. We take what the materialistic society uses for their own sense gratification, and we use it in Krishna's service. Mm -hmm. And in that way, we can spread Krishna consciousness. For our personal needs, we can live quite simply. Basically, whatever we need to keep body and soul together in order to maintain family and whatever else is as a, as, a, as a need of responsibility. But beyond that, <clears throat> we, we're, we live according to our needs. But beyond that, we can just, we can use anything for, for spreading Krishna consciousness, for preaching Krishna consciousness. So Bhakti Siddhanta was revolutionary in that, and he was criticized. Prabhupada was criticized. <clears throat> Great souls are always criticized by either envious people or materialistic people. And sometimes even by uh, Prakritas Bhaktas, devotees who don't have an understanding of Krishna consciousness. They can't understand the, under, the activities of a pure devotee. They also find fault. <laughs> But still, as Prabhupada says, the dogs will bark, but the caravan rolls on. Because <laughs> one who's fixed in pure devotional service to the Lord knows the desires of the Lord. And the Lord is conducting their life perfectly and completely at every moment. So they, they have no doubts how to serve the Lord or how to use everything in the service of the Lord. So, today is a very auspicious day. We can remember Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati and how it was by his command that our Srila Prabhupada became inspired to take Krishna consciousness around the world. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati gave that instructions to anyone who was willing to do it, but it was our Srila Prabhupada, who took up that mission and made it his life and soul. 
and we see what difficulty he had to go through in order to establish Krishna consciousness. But Yasya Devi Pada Bhaktir Yata Devi Tata Guru Tasyaita Katite Yarta Prakasanate Mahatmanaha. The one who has implicit faith in the instructions of the spiritual master, or even even better, one who makes the spiritual master's mission in life their mood of service becomes very, very dear to the Lord and very, very dear to the spiritual master, like that. But not popular amongst the people in general. <laughs> so, uh, great souls, they, they cannot, they're not easily understood, very rarely understood. But we can see that the, those who take shelter of them and become purified by their instructions and become fixed in devotional service. They are the examples of the teachings of the pure devotees. We can see by what they do in the world, how they establish and spread the Lord's mission in the world. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati gave that word to Srila Prabhupada. When Prabhupada came in 1922 to meet Bhakti Siddhanta at the request of his good friend, just to hear a saintly person speak, they came. Bhakti Siddhanta was giving a little talk as he, as he always did every evening on the rooftop of one building in Calcutta, which was the first temple at the time. And when they came, they offered their obeisances as was customary to saintly persons. And when, when Abhai, Srila Prabhupada, was getting up, Bhakti Siddhanta said, Oh, you are a very intelligent person. You should take Lord Chaitanya's teachings to the Western world. <laughs> Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati could see something in this personality who later took up his mission and made it a grand success. What Prabhupada speaks about, when he speaks about this incident, about how his spiritual master injected that instruction, he speaks about it in different ways. He says, I was shocked. <laughs> I was shocked. I was astonished. We haven't even met. I don't even know the person and he's already given me a mission to do. <laughs> but Prabhupada could understand after being there that this was a very wonderful saintly person. So he took that instruction into his heart. And he, Prabhupada said, and practically my whole life I was trying to feel, f see how to fulfill that mission. But it wasn't until I actually came to the West on the order that his instructions became a reality. <laughs> so the instructions of the spiritual master become the success of the devotee's devotion to Krishna. <laughs> One who makes that instruction is their focus in life. Then sometimes we think there are many instructions. So what is the most important instruction? Srila <laughs> Prabhupada there's there's two there's two instructions we can say we can take instructions and we can divide it into two two categories personal and extended the most important instruction on the personal level when Prabhupada was asked what is your most important instruction he said my most important instruction to my disciples is every day chant 16 rounds on beads without fail mm -hmm. That's the individual thing. And become the humble servant of the devotees to serve the Vaishnavas. Sadhu Sangha. And for the extended is whatever you get, give it. <laughs> In other words, become an instrument for the mercy that the spiritual master has given you. We call it preaching, we call it outreach. We call it being kind to others, or we call 
we call it in different ways, but in some way be an instrument for the mercy that is, we have been given for others. And that's our line. Our line is a preaching. Our line is Gostanandi, not Bhajananandi. Of course, here the mood is very much in the mood of Gostanandi, within Shishi Radha Gopinath Mandir. It's very strong. It's being inspired by Srila Prabhupada's great devotee, Srila His Holiness Radhanath Maharaj, who's made that his life and soul and, had, and has inspired that into the hearts and lives of those who are following him. And, and so, but as we, as we do that, we should also extend that out to others. That this is our preaching. Our preaching is for those who, are ta who came into the shelter of Srila Prabhupada. You have a debt to Prabhupada. <laughs> you have a debt. What is that debt? You have to give what you gave, what he gave you. <laughs> that's the debt. <laughs> and some, that's the, sometimes we call it the legacy of being a devotee. <laughs> but it's a sweet legacy. And in Kali Yuga, it's not easy to preach. <laughs> it's not. Most people don't want it or they want something well, we say watered down or less. But still, we go and we try anyway. Bhakti Siddhanta would often say, and Prabhupada would repeat, to make one devotee a devotee of Krishna, one person a devotee of Krishna, one has to shed 300 tons, 300 gallons of blood. It's not easy to change people, especially in this age of Kali, where materialistic uh, attractions are so numerous and people can get easily diverted to such things, even unconsciously, just by a way of life. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So to inspire others to take up the mission is also a part of preaching, not only to preach to others, but inspire others to become preachers too. <laughs> or people who, those who want to be an instrument for the mercy, <laughs> like that. So today is a special day, <laughs> and it's auspicious. We look forward to these days not only to honor the great souls as the personality, but to honor what they came to the world to give. That's the real glory of honoring the great souls. Not to, uh, we speak about their glories, their qualities, their characteristics, but mostly about their mission. Their mission is really why we are here, is an extension of that same mission. Shri Prahlad Prabhu, Hare Krishna. Thank you for joining us. Shri Prahlad Prabhu has come. So, there's so much to say, I don't know how much time we have. But I'm probably throughout the day there'll be more celebrations in honor of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. I'll tell one little story because I didn't tell any stories, did I? I just told other things. One little story. It's about Dina Vandal Prabhu tells this story, wherein. Uh, Prabhupada was in Vrindavan, Srila Prabhupada, our Srila Prabhupada. And it was, a, it was a cold morning. So one of Prabhupada's friends, kind of like an assistant, his name was Bhagaji. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was a resident of Vrindavan and he was also, you know, he would like to associate with Prabhupada. So he thought, it's very cold this morning and Prabhupada had would like to get some some nice hot prasadam, so I'm going, I'm going to make him this halava. Now somehow somebody brought some wheat germ, 
wheat germ is a kind of a, like a, a part of the wheat that's very nutritious and it's cultivated and it's packaged like that and it's like flakes so he had this jar of wheat germ he was going to make wheat germ halava for Prabhupada so he thought Prabhupada's really going to like this so he made this pot of wheat germ halava and he brought it personally to Prabhupada and he put it there and Prabhupada's looking at it and Prabhupada said what is it and he said, oh, this is, this is very nutritious, Prabhupada. It's halava made from wheat. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> Prabhupada said, take it away. <clears throat> he didn't want it. <laughs> so Bhagaji was, I mean, it was like a thunderbolt to his heart. Because he was so enthusiastic to make this something that Prabhupada would really like. You see Radha Gopina Chiki Jai. And so he was broken hearted. So he took the pot and he went into the temple room and he fell before the picture of Bhakti Siddhanta and started to pray to Bhakti Siddhanta. Oh Bhakti Sila, Bhakti Siddhanta, I wanted to please your disciple. I made this nice halava for him. But he's not happy with me. me. I must have offended him. So he was kind of like crying and begging like that for mercy at the same time being very repentive. And then after a while he hears from he hears from a distance Prabhupada Kov. Hey Bhagaji, Bhagaji, bring the halava, bring the halava, bring the halava. Bring the halava. So immediately he hears Prabhupada's voice, he picks it up, brings it in. Prabhupada starts to eat it and he practically eats the whole thing. So the message is that the spiritual master is merciful, but the spiritual master's spiritual master is more merciful. <laughs> they say in the family the father can be a little strict, but the grandfather really loves the child even more. <laughs> So, therefore, the, the param guru of one's, in one's line is more merciful than one's guru. Sometimes we say that, like that, like that. So for us who are disciples of Srila Prabhupada, you know, we pray to Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati to somehow or other to pl be able to please our Srila Prabhupada in the way we execute our devotional service knowing that he's very merciful. And we can all pray to Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati for his mercy and for his, ins for his inspiration and to understand deeper the message of Krishna consciousness. The deeper we go into the philosophical teachings, the more we can understand the beauty of this philosophy and how it applies to everything we do in life. Everything. Philosophy is not only something that you study and you speak about and you get a little idea. It's actually a way of life. Philosophy transformed into practice becomes bhakti. It becomes devotional service, pure devotional service to Krishna like that. So thank you very much. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj Ki. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Vitai go to Primanande, Hari Hari Go, Hare Krishna.